My name is Fendi and I am a naturalist with the City of Aurora's Open Space and Natural Resources Division. I am so excited to have you, your teachers, your classmates, and your friends all here with me today to learn about some of the wildlife that we have here in Aurora and their adaptations during this Discovering Aurora's True Nature virtual series. With many of us having to stay indoors, these videos are going to help us learn about some of the mysterious, fascinating, and marvelous wildlife that we have here in Aurora. So before we get started, I wanted to let you know that there are a few questions I would love for you to answer before watching the rest of the video. If you have not answered the questions, please pause the video, discuss the questions, and then resume the video. Today, we're gonna to be going on a nature hike, and we're going to be examining the wildlife that call Star K Ranch their home. At the end, we'll have some really fun post-video activities and questions for you to answer. All right, so here at the Trailhead Kiosk, we have a map of Star K Ranch. Star K Ranch is outlined in yellow. It's about 300 acres of Aurora open space. We are going to start our hike here, where it says you are here. And we're gonna come around the wetland loop, come on the Creekside Trail, and then back up around to the Morrison Nature Center. Also located on the kiosk are the rules and regulations. Make sure to read them over before you start your nature hike. The rules and regulations are here so everyone can be safe and have an enjoyable time, and to protect the wildlife in the area. So before we get started on our nature hike, there are a few essential items that you need to have a spectacular time. Let's take a look. Alright, so the first essential thing that we need to go on a nature hike is water. Very, very important and will give you a far more enjoyable experience. So here I have a hydration pack. These are pretty nifty and relatively cheap. You just put them inside of your backpack and you can drink the water through this hose. Or you can just bring a regular old water bottle. Next essential thing that we need is some sun protection. Some sunscreen, maybe glasses or a hat or you can even just wear some long pants and long sleeves. Next essential thing is a snack. Very, very important, especially for me, to have something to keep me going, give me a little bit of energy. Some other items that are really not essential, but nice to have is a notebook. So you can write down what you see, what you experience while you're on your nature hike. Maybe draw a few pictures of some plants and animals. Some bug spray. If you're like me, mosquitoes absolutely love my blood. So I need some bug spray so that I can have a far more enjoyable experience. We have some field guides here, one for birds, another one for tracks and scat. Not essential, but it's a good resource to have while you're on your hike. Next, some binoculars. I really like these, they're really small and compact. Again, not essential. Finally, we have a little hand lens so you can get a nice close-up look at some insects or maybe some rocks. Hand sanitizer, always good to have, especially right now during the COVID-19 crisis. And I have a little bug net and a bug box. If we see any insects, I'll catch one, put it inside the bug box, got a magnifying glass on top of it so we could get a closer look. So these are just some of the things that you want to make sure you have. Water, sunscreen, snack, most important. One of the most essential things that you need for a nature hike are closed-toed shoes. You don't want to go on a hike wearing sandals or flip-flops because it doesn't give your feet any protection from the elements, from bugs getting into your shoes from stepping in the mud. So when you come out, you want to make sure you are wearing tennis shoes or hiking boots or any kinds of shoes that give, give you protection around your entire foot. 
So now that we have all of our essential items to have an enjoyable nature hike, let's go hit the trail. So while we're on our nature hike, it's important to have good trail etiquette. You want to stay on the trail to protect habitat for wildlife as well as their food and water. If you bring your dog with you on your hike, please make sure you have it on a leash and you pick up after it. We don't want our pets chasing after deer, scaring them away from their homes, or their waste polluting our water. Pack it in and pack it out. If you brought it with you, make sure you take it with you. Don't take anything home with you that you did not bring, like flowers or branches. Appreciate them in their natural state and leave them there to do their purpose. If you are willing, do your part and pick up any trash that you, pick up, that you see on the trail. If you brought a bag, you can put the trash in the bag or you can put it in your backpack. And then make sure to use hand sanitizer afterwards. And practice leave no trace. If someone else gets on the trail after us, we want to make sure it's pretty much impossible for them to know that we were here. Now that we know some, some good trail etiquette, let's continue. So as we're on our nature hike, I want us to do this scavenger hunt. And when you come out to do the hike on your own, I want you to do the same scavenger hunt. So we're gonna be looking for all the different things that I have listed here. Now we're probably not gonna find all of them, like bug on a flower, because the flowers haven't started growing yet. It's a little too early in the spring. But we should be able to find most of the items on the scavenger hunt. All right, so now we are on the creek side trail. And the creek that we're hiking along is called Sand Creek. This creek actually breaks off from the Platte River up in Denver and flows through Aurora. The ecosystem that we are in right now is called a riparian ecosystem. Riparian is just a fancy word that says next to any body of water. So riparian ecosystem can be next to a creek, can be next to a lake, a pond, a river. It's just pointing out the area that's literally right next to a body of water. So the plants here and the animal communities that live along this body of water would not be able to survive even a hundred feet that way. And that's simply because there's just not enough water for them to survive. So here we have a cottonwood tree. Cottonwood trees are the dominant tree species in this riparian ecosystem at Star K Ranch. Cottonwoods need a ton of water, so you can only find them growing next to a body of water or in a riparian ecosystem. Their scientific name is Populus deltoides. Deltoides means shoulder blade shaped. So their leaves are shaped like our shoulder blades. So if I were to put this right there, it would be the same shape as my shoulder blade. Cottonwoods are what they call dioecious trees, meaning that each individual tree is either a male or a female. Most trees have both male and female flowers on one individual tree but cottonwoods are either boy or girl. The bark on a cottonwood has the same active ingredient as aspirin does. So the Native Americans used to harvest the bark to use it for its pain-killing effects. Some Native American tribes also believed 
that when you heard the wind rustling in the leaves, it meant that the spirits were trying to tell you something. So maybe I have a message waiting for me. Cottonwoods have really thick bark. And if you were to look at the skin, at your skin underneath a microscope, it would look exactly like the bark of a cottonwood tree. Full of valleys and ridges like a mountainous area, the bark helps protect them from the elements as well as from anything that's trying to eat the tree. When you see birds moving up and down cottonwood bark, it's typically because they're looking for insects that are lodged underneath the bark. The bark provides really good habitat for insects as well as other animals. Sometimes you can find really small bats that are lodged underneath cottonwood bark as they're sleeping during the day or when they're hibernating. This particular tree has some lichen on it and lichen is a really interesting organism. It's actually made up of two organisms, bacteria and fungi. It is a symbiotic relationship. Symbiotic means two organisms working together to survive. In this case, the bacteria make sugars for the fungi to eat and the fungi makes a home, an umbrella-like structure that the bacteria live inside and are protected from the elements. Super, super cool. Beavers are native here in Aurora, as well as to North America. They are the second largest rodent in the world, and they live underwater. They have several adaptations to help them live underwater. One of them is their fur. I have a beaver pelt here. Beavers have glands in their skin that, that produce an oil that covers all of this fur to make it completely waterproof. So when beavers are swimming underwater, they're actually never getting wet. They also have a third eyelid. When they dive underneath the water, that third eyelid closes, kind of like your cats if you have one and acts like a goggle as they're swimming underneath the water. They also have a little flap in their nose and in their ears that close when they're diving. That way they don't get any water rushing into their nose or into their e ears. I really wish I had those. It'd be really nice. Another adaptation that they have is their tail. So their tail is flat and it helps them to propel through the water. I'm sure most of us have heard that they slap their tails onto the water when they're communicating with each other when there's predators coming around. They also have webbed feet. This is a dried specimen so it doesn't look very good but you can see that there's webbing in between the toes kind of like a duck's so that they can propel themselves through the water. Beavers love to eat wood and they cut down a whole lot of trees like this tree right here. This tree was cut down by a beaver and here I have a beaver skull and you can see those giant front top and bottom teeth that they have there and they use those teeth to cut down trees and their teeth consistently grow throughout their entire lifetime because every time they cut down a tree, they grind their teeth down. That is another adaptation. Because if their teeth didn't regrow, they would probably die after cutting down two or three trees. You can also see that the rest of their teeth are flat like a typical herbivore. So they don't need sharp teeth because they're, they don't need any meat. Their teeth are adapted to eating wood and other vegetation. So up the creek here, we have a beaver dam. Right there. So beavers build dams to protect themselves from predators. The dams help water pool and collect and makes it really, really deep. Therefore, predators like coyotes and eagles and bears can't get after them in that deep water. After they are done building their dams, 
they proceed to build themselves a lodge, which is their home. Behind me, there is a beaver lodge. So they build this lodge, cutting down trees and picking up branches and stacking it together kind of to look like a pyramid. Then they make an entrance that is underneath the lodge. So they make a little tunnel going from under the water in the soil to get up into the lodge. When they're inside of the lodge, there are two dens. The first den, or room, is the, the drying room. So they hang out in there and they wait till they're pretty dry and then they go into the next den, or the next room, which is kind of like a family room. That's where they hang out together um, as a family and eat and just relax and, and get away from predators. Beavers are what's called ecosystem engineers. And they're called that because they create habitat for plants and animals that otherwise would not be able to live in this area. Behind me, we are looking at a pool that's created by this beaver dam. This pool invites animals like ducks and frogs and turtles to live in this area that otherwise can't live in really fast moving water of the creek on the other side. It also brings in plants that can't grow next to fast moving water, but do well next to still pools. Some Native American tribes believe that beavers were water gods, and they believe that because they realized that beavers built habitat for other plants and animals that the Native Americans could utilize. So this pool attracts deer, the deer would come to drink the water and then the Native Americans could uh, hunt the deer and they would get some food for their families. It also grows other plant species like cattails that they could use for edible and medicinal purposes. So we are now standing in a wetland, which is still a riparian ecosystem because it's still next to a body of water. But this body of water is not moving like the creek was that we were just next to. We are standing next to what we call the J Pond. And when water is still like this, cattails love to flourish. So here I have a cattail. It's also called corn dog grass, or sometimes I like to call it a hot dog on a stick. The hot dog part that we see are the flowers of the cattail. Cattails are monoecious meaning that they have male and female flowers on the same stem. We talked about how the cottonwoods are dioecious, meaning that one cottonwood is either male or female. Well, the cattails have both parts. One plant is male and female. And these are the flowers of the cattail. They don't look super pretty like some of the nice colorful petaled flowers that we're used to, because these guys um, spread with the wind. They don't need pollinators to attract. So cattails grow by these seeds or they grow by rhizomes. And rhizomes are basically like above ground roots. So this whole section of cattails could all be the same plant, the same genetic individual. So cattails act like sponges. They suck up the toxins from the water that they are living in. So if there's some toxins in this pond, the toxins are going to be um, absorbed by the cattails. Cattails have many edible and medicinal qualities. Their rhizomes have more starch in them than potatoes, and they have more protein than rice. The stems of the cattails can be cooked or eaten raw like asparagus, and they're immature flowers, so when this hot dog part is green, you can cook it up and literally eat it like a hot dog on a stick, or like corn on the cob. <laughs> so these fluffy, cotton these fluffy cotton heads are the seeds, and like I said, they are dispersed by the wind, and these seeds actually have some flammable characteristics. 200 years ago, people used to combine these seeds with other ingredients to make fireworks. So if you really wanted to, you could light these seed heads on fire and use it like a torch. Cattails also have medicinal purposes. This fluff 
from the seed head can be used to treat sores and burns on your skin. And rhizomes accelerate the healing of wounds. Super, super cool. There's lots that you can do with these cattails, edibly and medicinally. And the Native Americans depended on these substantially for both of those reasons. One mammal that you may have a chance of seeing in your neighborhood is the raccoon. And here I have a raccoon pelt. You can see the stripes on the tail. Raccoons have some of the most dexterous hands in nature. And dexterous means skillful with the hands. They have similar hands like ours with individual fingers that can move independently from one another. This allows them to do things like open doors and use tools that most other animals can't do that just have paws, like, like a bear or a coyote. The Native Americans were the first ones to notice this. The English word raccoon comes from a Powhatan word that means animal that scratches with its hands. The black markings across raccoons' faces have historically associated them with being conniving thieves or tricksters. But this black fur on their face acts just like the black stickers that athletes wear under their eyes. The dark color absorbs light, which reduces the glare in their vision. Another common mammal that you will find in Aurora open spaces and our neighborhoods is the cottontail rabbit. So here I have a cottontail pelt. And cottontails have a fuzzy stub tail that kind of looks like a cotton ball. Hence the name cottontail rabbit. Cottontails live to be about three years old in the wild. But only around 15% of all babies make it to adulthood. They are very important prey species for many predators, so a lot of them don't get to grow up to be adults. The females are fully developed and ready to mate when they are just three months old. They typically have three to five litters per year, and each litter has about three to eight young in, in them. They live in burrows or holes that are made by other animals, so like in prairie dog holes, or they live in grass nests that are made in, in shallow depressions in the ground or, or a slight slant in the ground. And they eat their own poop. So they first poop out pellets that are green color that still have some nutrients in them. So they eat those pellets and when they poop them out again, all the nutrients have been absorbed. Pretty clever, but kind of gross. They are crepuscular meaning that they only come out during twilight hours. And twilight is really early in the morning or really late in the evening. And their most common way to camouflage is to act like a large stone or a rock. So when you see them in the neighborhood sometimes, you'll see them just sitting there all curled up in a ball, and they're trying to trick you to thinking that they are in an inanimate object, that they're just a stone. And then when you get too close, all of a sudden they dash out of the way. Thank you for joining me, Naturalist Fendi, on this nature video journey as we explored and learned about the riparian ecosystem at Star K Ranch and some of the adaptations of the wildlife that live here. Your next task is to complete the post video questions and visit Star K Ranch to do a nature hike and a scavenger hunt. If for any reason you are not able to come do your own nature hike, we have provided other activities that you can do at home or in your neighborhood. You may want to send your answered questions to your teacher for credit, or you can send them to us, the Naturalist team. We would love to hear from you. Our email addresses will be in the description box below if you want to send us a note or send us your answers to be reviewed.
We are so grateful that you joined us today to learn a little bit more about Aurora and the beautiful nature that resides here. We hope to see you in another video or in person at one of our nature centers someday soon. Thank you so much.